Welcome to Empowering Pastors and Leaders. We are very excited that you're watching. This is week two of Team of Teams. Want to make sure that you and I are, are growing because, uh, you know, these last few years have been somewhat challenging as a lot of the church world has, and, and even businesses, have had to go into more of a maintenance mode than into progressive mode. But 2022 is progressive. We are not going to sit back. We're not going to, our laurels are done. Now it's time to move forward. And it's time to literally grab it and make it happen. So that's what we're going to do. And so Team of Teams is a major part of that. Last week we covered some of the basics. And today I want to talk about uh, the necessity of building Team of Teams. And then over the next few weeks what we're going to get into is how to build your team. But the very first thing we want to be able to do is understand that there are two types of, uh, two types of, of tree. We touched it last week, but I want to get back to it. And that is you have a deep root tree or you have a shallow root tree. The problem with the shallow root tree is that when the winds come and the storms blow, many times those are the very first trees to go over. They're usually a pine tree or a, 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 you know, those type of uh, shallow roots. I'm trying to think of another one. Evergreens and things in that manner. But when you go to a deep root or a deep hard root, which would be like an oak tree or a maple tree, they're not as much wide as they are deep. And when we're building teams, there's a need for making sure that we are going to grow deep. And why are we going to do that is because if we don't grow deep, then there's no way to bring it beyond ourselves. We talked about low self-esteem last week, how many leaders struggle, and this is why churches stay small. They stay small because many churches, the pastors, have a low self-esteem and are not willing to build teams and are actually... What's the word I'm looking for? They're actually intimidated by successful people. But I want to remind you that successful people coming to your church is actually one of the greatest compliments that you could actually have. Or if you get people in your company that are more skilled than you are, that is actually a great compliment because they know their skill level. And if they're in their skill level willing to submit to the vision that you're running with, then that means they believe in you. That is not something to shun from or run from. That is something to grab and hold as dear and near as you can. We have people in this church where their gift sets are so much higher than mine in so many different areas of life. And I celebrate the differences because their differences are going to enhance and make the root system in this church, in God's house, generational. So we talked about Team of Teams and how it's a generational mindset. Now, we find the, the collision in the mindsets in, uh, in Exodus chapter 18. If you want to study that, I think it's so very important to study. Uh, I want to remind you that Moses was pastoring over two and a half million people. Lord Jesus. If the statistics are correct concerning uh, leadership pain, then um, for every hundred, you have ten. So every thousand, you have a hundred. Every 100,000, you have 10,000. Every million, you have 100,000. So he had over 250,000 people that were against him in his own leadership. That's encouraging, isn't it? But here we are, as we are looking at what was happening, Moses was pastoring all these people, and his job was one that he, he, he would, like, be the judge. So people would come to them with their problems, and they'd say, well, I have this problem with this person, and he'd have to be the judge between the scenario. And all day long, that's what he did. Every day, that's what he did. All day, that's what he did. He saw people, heard their complaints. Saw people, heard their complaints. Brought an answer. Saw people, heard complaints. Brought an answer. Saw people, heard complaints. Brought an answer. Finally, he came to a place where his father-in-law, thank God for father-in-laws, his father-in-law pulled him aside and said to him, dude, you're going to kill yourself. You're not going to live. There's no way you can do this capacity all by yourself. And, you know, it's important to recognize that many times we feel like, and, and especially if you're a, a, a younger pastor or a pastor with esteem issues, 
You feel like you have to do it all. And the problem is, is you're going to kill yourself. And actually what you're doing is you're killing generational leadership. Because that leadership will die with you. So we must get back to Jethro and his mind and how he spoke to Moses under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to save Moses' life. And to literally make it so that the children of Israel could be pastored. One person cannot pastor a lot of people well. Now, uh, studies, I believe, the majority of them that I've read, a pastor, one pastor can really pastor about 150 people by themselves. And someone can do it well, you know, do the follow through and do all the stuff. But much more than that, there's really no way that a pastor can really truly love people the way he is supposed to or she is supposed to with uh, just themselves. Well, they might be able to, but they're soon to be divorced. So uh, it's important that we look at what Jethro said. Jethro looked at him and said, listen, um, where are we? Uh, 18, let's, uh, let's verse, verse 19. Now obey my voice. I will give you advice and God be with you. You shall represent the people before God and bring their cases to God. You shall warn them about the, the statutes and the laws and make them known the way in which they should walk that they must do. Moreover, look for able men from all the people who fear God, who are trustworthy and hate a bribe. That's important, by the way. And place such men over uh, the people of chiefs of thousands, uh, hundreds, fifties, and tens. And let them judge the people. So what Moses did is he looked at him and he said, listen now, I, I mean uh, Jethro, what you're doing, Moses, you're creating shallow roots. Your roots are so shallow that you're going to die, and so is the tree. If you're going to do this well, you're going to have to have deep roots. Which means you're going to have to think, as we were talking uh, even last week, you're going to have to think way beyond yourself and learn how to trust people. That's a real issue with people that have low self-esteem. They don't trust people. Pastors, you've been wounded. Pastors, you've had people lie to you. Pastors, you've had people literally stab you in the back. Pastors, you've had people do so many vile things. It's amazing. You have been abandoned. You have been lied about. You, you've lived the life of Joseph. The problem is becoming cynical. The problem is becoming a person that is cynical. And what does that mean? Is that you're always waiting for the other, the other shoe to drop. You're waiting for the, the, the knife to come out to be stabbed. So therefore you trust nobody. And I want you to recognize something. That means you're unhealthy. If you are unhealthy, you're ministering out of unhealth. Which means if you're ministering out of unhealth emotionally, then your preaching is skewed. If your preaching is skewed and your business plan is skewed, your ministry is skewed because of wounds, hurting people hurt people. They don't let people in. They don't love people properly. They don't minister to people properly. They get angry at people. They're willing to throw people away. We can go through the list of stuff what happens when you become a cynical leader. You cannot become cynical. But the problem is, the way to become cynical is to get tired. Just say it again. Number one reason churches do not grow, the pastor is too busy. The reason pastors are too busy is because they're unwilling to trust people. The reason that most pastors are unwilling to trust people is because of the wounds they've had from their past. Therefore, what, is, what has occurred is a cycle of death. I call it a cycle of survival. You'll have your 25 people for the rest of your ministry, and it's just you guys hanging out on Sundays, singing kumbaya, prophesying over each other, and hoping that maybe somebody's going to walk in the door. And I want you to know something, that's not kingdom. God's kingdom grows. Amen. A church that's 25 for more than two years, God, there's a problem. 
And the problem always lies at the feet of the pastor, the feet of the business owner, the feet of the leader. It always is there, the feet of the department head. It's not growing, it is you. And so we must, at times, we've got to take a very realistic view of ourselves and say, where am I broken? Because if my job is to create team of teams, if my, te my job is to develop people and mature people as their leader, yet I can't do that because I'm not healthy, how do I get healthy? You've got to get your soul whole. You've got to be James chapter 1. Receiving the engrafted word of God that saves sozos, the soul, the intellect, emotions, and will. This is a must. You must stay healthy. The Bible says in 1 John, where are you found? What is it? 3 John verse 2. I pray that you'll prosper and be in good health even as your soul prospers. What do you mean your soul, your intellect, emotions, and will? As a leader, you have got to become a healthy individual. Because if you do not become a healthy individual, you will stay shallow, out of protection mode. And you will doom the plans of God. Look, just look at our area, where we are. This town is relatively small, 6,500. Our county is 88,000 people. That's still not a lot of people for an entire county. But in a county of 88,000 people, there should be at least 8 to 10 churches of 1,000 people. That's still only one-tenth. Where's the other 90? You see, this is where we come into the controversy, and people have gotten somewhat abrupt with me as I, that I, I, I'm pushing growth. I'm always pushing growing. I'm always pushing maturation. I'm always pushing to go better and do, be and do greater things because we need more people saved. Can I hear an amen? We need Christian businesses to make more money. Can I hear an amen? We need that. But you can't do that if you as the leader is unhealthy. So you've got to address yourself. Well, Moses wasn't willing to address himself. And let's be real, Moses had issues. Moses had anger issues. Moses had esteem issues. Moses had identity issues. How do we know that? Well, remember, he, he killed the Egyptian, went back to his brethren and said, why are you guys fighting? Oh, you got to kill us like you did the Egyptian? He had identity issues. He wasn't sure, he wasn't sure where he belonged. You cannot have an identity issue if you're going to be a great leader. You must be a person who knows yourself. You must be a person who's willing to grow. You must be a person who's willing to address yourself realistically. What are my issues? Because God has greatness for you, not goodness for you, but he can't bring you to greatness if you can't even handle yourself. Amen. I pray that over myself every single day. Pray it over my family. Pray it over this church. Pray the covenant. Part of the covenant is healthy soul. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. You've got to address yourself. Where am I messed up? Where am I unhealthy? Because a leader that is unhealthy will stop right here. Actually, will eliminate this. All leaders that do not have oversight, that have the ability to correct them, you can always know they have a low self-esteem. Every leader that says they have oversight but hasn't talked to them in a month, you know they're not submitted. A leader that does that will make sure that this box is no longer even on the page. Never mind what's down here. I wrote, took too long to write it all or I'd erase it. That pastor will be right here by himself, have a few trustee members, and that's about all. I want you to know that that right there never propels God's kingdom. So as a team of team person, we've got to, first of all, address ourselves. Number two, we have to identify our own strength. 
You can't identify your own strength as a leader if you're unhealthy. You will always think that you do everything the best. The Bible says don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. And again, this is why many pastors, when somebody very skilled comes into their congregation, makes it too difficult for them to be there, literally driving them out of the sanctuary. They say, I believe it was in, uh, I'm trying to remember which book it was, uh, maybe a Barna book. Uh, yep, it was. It was a Barna book that simply said, less than 5% of all business people, successful business people, stay in churches. It's because the pastors are intimidated by them and drive them out. So once you've found out where you are and where your need for surety is, is located, then you have to identify your strengths. How do you identify a strength? The best way to identify a strength is What is easy for you to do? What is easy for you but is hard for somebody else is really showing your gift. Jen is an amazing organizer. She's over our groups, education. I'm just going to be straight. I could not do it, period. I could not do what Carla does with the fiscals. I definitely could not do what Pastor Aaron does with the children. I know what I'm good at. What Moses was good at and what his father-in-law told him is your job is to stand up and warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them know the way in which they should walk. That's what his strength was. His strength was the voice of God to the people. That's why God didn't send Aaron to go address Pharaoh. He sent Moses to address Pharaoh. That was his job. But then he took on all these other jobs by being the judge of all the people. When you identify your strength and you identify your gift, then you're an individual that now has the understanding of how to build teams. You cannot build teams until you identify your strengths. Where a lot of uh, startup businesses and or startup churches fail is the pastor many times is... If he's an evangelist, he can generate new people, but he can't keep them. If he's more pastor, he can keep people, but he can't get them. So the necessity to be able to staff properly and build teams properly is to identify your weakness. So therefore you say, I know where I'm weak. I know what I have to do. I know who I have to pull alongside of me because if I pull them alongside of me, they're going to... Anybody ever play with a teeter-totter when you were a kid? Somebody gets on... You know what a teeter-totter is? It's that big board and in the middle and it teeters back and forth. A seesaw. We call it a teeter-totter when I was a kid. That was a week ago. So a seesaw. Your goal is to balance the seesaw with your teams. If you balance the seesaw with your teams, then you're not off to one side or another. You're not out of balance. So that means in every one of the departments that's sitting here, the first question is, where is your greater strength? When you identify your greater strength, now you find other leaders who balance out your strength with the opposite and you know they're the first person you need to put next to you. So myself, very evangelistic. Um, I love evangelism, share the gospel, 
can get people to the church, that's my gift. Retaining isn't as much my gift. So I brought on people to retain. And they do a great job. I brought on people that I know that, it's not that I'm not a sweet person or a kind person. Thank you, I'll take one amen. Um, but my focus is not as good because I'm more sporadic, visionary. Yes. But a person with the skill of administration can make sure that people are loved properly because they can organize how to touch them, reach them, minister to them. If they're there or they're not there. We're in a, a more people like my style is like, ah! you know, let's go. That's important, but if you don't identify your strength, then the teeter-totter or the seesaw is always going to be canted to one direction, which means you're never going to be balanced. So for his Tabernacle Family Church, what we've done is, I'm going to put this box back because I believe it's one of the most important boxes. If you're not under authority, you should not be in authority. I have a lot of denominational pastors tell me, well, I'm under my district. You haven't talked to your district in so long. They wouldn't know if you have a problem. They wouldn't know if you're going to hell or not. That's not oversight. You've got to be close enough for someone to be able to smell when you're wrong. They've got to have your name on their tongue to pray for you. I believe that's one of the most important. Then you have your pastor, the visionary. Now, in New York State, we have trustees. Trustees in this church are only over finances. They do not run the church's money. That's the visionary's job. But they keep in check. And then we have what we call the depth. These are the deep roots. We have his kids, outreach, people care, Worship, assimilation, which is the ability to not just get them come through the doors, but keep them. Youth, education in groups, safety, security, remnant Bible college, and young adults, and administration. All of these are the top level. Watch now. These are your teams. These are the teams. Watch. But these are the team of teams. So the issue is, if you can't identify your strength, therefore staffing your weakness, there's no way to be able to build teams properly. Because you'll always put in weak people in the boxes. You'll put in weak people because they don't intimidate you. I love strong-willed people. No, I like it because it makes it so that we can have good fights. I don't mind fights. I don't mind disagreements. I think if your staff ne never disagrees and doesn't have a platform to vocalize it, then you're a weak leader. You must staff for strength because your first tier leaders have to be the ones that will then take on the training for the next tier. You're duplicating yourself. You're doing what Jesus did. Acts chapter 2 verse 42 says what? And they remain steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. What? Fellowship. Breaking of bread and prayer. That right there is the 
outline for a successful church. But what happens is most pastors who can't identify their strength or are dealing with a low self-esteem, they'll stack their team so they can control easily all the people under them. The joy of strong-willed people is not that you're not going to have entanglement. The actual job of the leader is to steer the strong-willed. You're a person that steers individuals, not controls them. As a leader who steers people, you're enabling them to be themselves, therefore identify their strengths, therefore identify what team member they need to have next to them. So now you've gone from just you to you and your top tier leaders who are great strengths to now they're training leaders under them who then will train leaders under them. So now you're creating deep roots. I had an individual one time, they were a leader for one year. And after that, I found that nothing changed. Literally, they were the ones that were always seen. Literally, they were the ones that were always in control. Literally, they were the ones that were always the voice. And I brought that individual into my office one day and I simply said to them, I need you to know that you're no longer the leader over that team. Well, why? I said, because you're not leading the team. You are the team. And you've had a year and if you can't develop teams after a year, then you have no desire to, which gets back down to, yes, Esteem. He was mad. He was mad. He actually got in a little vocal argument with me. And I looked at him and said, dude, I always win. It's the way it is. I'm the pastor of the church. I win. So you can either submit and develop or you can move on. And at that point, he stayed. For a little bit. But remember, passive rebellion is more violent than outward rebellion. Because outward rebellion says, I don't agree with it. I don't like it. And I'm not going to put up with it. Passive rebellion is, you told me to sit down, and I am. But inside, I'm still standing up. And rebellion is always as the sin of witchcraft. So to highlight, I just want to talk about uh, Minister McKenzie. Minister McKenzie, on Sunday, uh, she, she did exactly what we're talking about. So she was leading on Sunday. I believe you led two songs. Oh, you led them all. But when it came down to I needed a praise song, like high praise, like kick it at the end, she brought in Isaiah. Now the week before was the pr Christmas program, but the week before that, when did you sit in the back? Christmas Eve. Christmas Eve, I'm looking for Minister McKenzie. She's not up on the altar. Where's Minister McKenzie? And I saw her in the far back with her husband. And I went, that's my girl. Why? She didn't need to be up front. She was leading from way back there. And I want you to know that that is success. A lot of people say, well, you know, if I'm not needed, then I'm not important. No, that's esteem. If you truly have identified your skill sets and truly understand how powerful you are as a leader, 
then the greatest joy is always developing the leaders around you. That is the greater joy, is knowing that the people that God has given you voice in their life, that they will accelerate beyond you. A parent that does not want their children to do better than them should not be a parent. Sadly enough, we see that a lot. My kids are smarter than I am. It is true. I have no problem saying it. My children are smarter than I am. They're more gifted than I am. They're great speakers. They're great pastors. I have no problem, no problem admitting it at all. And both of them could beat me up. No problem saying it at all. People think, well, I mean, what do you do? I'm going to get them as close to me as possible because they're going to make me look really good. And they're going to build team of teams. When your church has two and three generations deep of leaders, the wind can't blow it over. This is why, even after the pandemic, our church did not wait to get to 50%. We were back at, well, I think, what, we were like 75 to 80%, maybe a little bit more than that, percent-wise. We were running 750 on a Sunday morning, and now we're running 630 to 650 on a Sunday morning, except for this last Sunday. It was a really crash-and-burn Christmas Sunday. But other than that, I mean, we're running good numbers. We're just 100 low. And then when you look during the weekdays, we're still bringing in, I think they said, what, 150 during the weekday that were here on Sunday. Never mind those that are watching online. Our recovery was great, and our recovery was great not because we're nice people. It's because we have teams of teams. And each, each one of these leaders, their job is to lead the people under them and to develop them. And every time you do that, you're creating a deep root system that no matter what the problem comes, you'll always still have a tree standing. The issue is the leader. So you sent me your homework. If you didn't do your homework, if you're watching online, you didn't do your homework, PayPal, pastorspencer at gmail.com, $25. I appreciate that. I do take cash, no checks. Thank you. Why do I charge? Because I've taken time to develop this. And if you're not going to respect it enough to be able to, uh, to, be able to uh, do the homework, then you can pay me for that, which is great with me. I don't mind either payment or uh, do the homework. Both work for me well. I just want you to know that if we're going to develop teams properly to have successful churches and successful businesses as kingdom people, it never happens on accident. And these principles are all the way back into the book of Exodus. They're not new. The problem is, is that we're afraid that the world is infiltrating the church, and that's not the problem at all. The problem is that the world has stolen the church's principles. My last studies that I did said that only two or three churches in all of America don't work by this, this corporate structure. Don't work by it. Only two or three. And we're talking mega churches. All the other ones do. Now remember, mega churches, it's only 1% or over 1,000. 1% of all the churches in America are over 1,000 people. That's it. All companies that I know of work by this process. This is the corporate structure. You were corporate. You were corporate. Your corporate, corporate people. The corporate people understand this is, uh, this is normal. The problem in the church world, because of this, we abolish this. And we say this. And then we can't understand why God's not blessing. 
So there's a need to grasp this. If we're going to build good teams, what, are, what is a team? A team is a group of people, God's people, who deserve to have good leadership. We have the greatest job in the world. We get to represent the King of Kings and Lord of Lords on this planet. We get to lead the greatest army on the planet, the army of the Lord. We get to introduce heaven to earth as leaders. We have the most important job on the planet, more important than the President of the United States. Yet it is the least trained, developed in leadership because of Get ready, I'll end with this. Get ready to speak in uh, Pakistan uh, next month. No, I'm not going. Uh, had the, uh, if I wanted to go, I probably could, but I'm not going. So I'm going to do mine by Zoom. But there'll be 300 pastors. And they reached out to me and said, this is the same folks that we uh, do 183 nations with a week. And they said... The churches are all in competition here. And I said, well, welcome to America too. Why would a church be in competition? Which does what? Eliminates this. Which does what? Which does what? Minimize God's kingdom. We have got to be people that know what our job is. And as leaders, our job is different than those that we're raising up. Our job is to take these leadership principles and then regurgitate them to the ones that we're training. So what you're getting, even with this team of teams training... You should be regurgitating to your main leaders that you're raising up that are what? The opposite of your strength. So what? So that you can all lead the same way instead of being at a tug of war. But if you get trained and then you don't teach your, your team the training that you got trained, then you're expecting them to, through osmosis, I guess, figure out how they're supposed to lead. Well, how can they lead unless they're trained? And why would you let, want them to lead in any other way than the way you were trained? Because then it will be a tug of war where they have their own style of leadership and you have your style of leadership. That's called division, which makes the vision die. So team of teams is extremely important. Well, thank you very much for watching. We'll pick this up next week. We'll do probably four weeks of Team of Teams. You can go on uh, empoweringpastors.com to learn a little bit more about us. We do coaching for pastors, for churches, and for business folks. We do EQ and other types of uh, testing, as well as what we do is um, you can go to our Empowering Pastors Facebook page, and, um, or you could email me at drspencer at empoweringpastors.com. Thank you so much for watching. We pray that you'll tune in next week and continue to be challenged and grow. Have a great day.